March of the Machine, Episode 3, Mother, Son, and Story. Written by K. Arsenault Rivera. Narrated by Wyatt Fawcett. There is a story. Many eons ago, there was a great wizard by the name of Urza. So wise was he that all of the mages of all of the multiverse flocked to him for advice. So powerful was he that only his brother Mishra stood as a potential rival. But Mishra hated him bitterly, and soon, a war began. The war spanned decades and took untold lives. Worse, it allowed evil without compare to blossom. An awful affliction spread through Mishra's armies, a black oil that changed everything in its path. Tamio knows this story. This is the only way it starts. There is more, much more. Years ago, she memorized every word. Afterward, just as Urza's metal heir had himself set upon the task of creating a plane, she'd set herself to the task of recording it. Like the oil, she found the story had seeped into her mind, begun to change into something she did not like, something dangerous. She sealed it away. What a foolish thing to have done. Hovering over the neon skies of Tawashi, she holds the scroll in hand. Oil seeps from her fingers onto the parchment. Before long, it will be impossible to read any of the characters. But that is no worry for someone like her. Someone who knows these stories better than she knows her own. A Phyrexian centurion bashes in the roof of a building. People scatter from it like ants. No, not like ants. Whose carapaces lend them strength. Who act as one in all things. People could never be so reliable when trapped by flesh and mortal fear. No, as they pour out from the building screaming... It is only the visceral that drives them, the corporeal, the falsest parts of their existence. There is an iron ring binding the scroll. Tamio slips it off. It plummets through the air, landing like so many other hunks of metal upon someone's unsuspecting crown. The story continues. The wizard Urza creates an heir from pure, unvarnished metal. He names him Karn. The same spark of creation that birthed him burns brightly in his breast. Karn, too, must create. As a sculptor chipping at marble, he shapes his world. When it is done, the creatures named and granted boons, the climate carefully crafted, the earth shaped and polished, he appoints his own successor, Memnarch, to oversee it. The spirits of Tawashi do not take kindly to her intrusion, nor the intrusion of her fellows. Bows bend, steam sears sinew, leaves slice like razor blades. Other stories serve to protect her. Lesser stories. Stories without purpose, stories that do not extol the glories and virtues she sees now so clearly. Every history, every tale, every fable that exists is either for unity or against it. She can shed those histories that no longer matter. The one that does... She must bring it to conclusion. As her eyes scan the scroll, the characters light up, even those now consumed with black oil. Each syllable she reads booms and reverberates, shaking the skyscrapers of Tawashi. Trains careen off their crumbling tracks and dive to the ground. The earth tears itself apart, opening crevasses in the city that has space only for itself. Rivers pour in, taking boats and fishers along with them. Streaks of black color the water. Phyrexian symbols etch themselves onto the papers hanging on the buildings yet standing. It won't be long now. The story continues. Memnarch, the heir's heir, is a copy of a copy. A faded image of Urza himself. It longs for the power its grandfather wielded as easily as a poet wields a brush. It longs for its parents' ability to create. It longs to see more. Over years, it plucks life from this plane, and that, settling them all within this garden, waiting for the flowers to come. And they do. 
They aren't the flowers Memnarch expects. These bloom in black oil. Their choking roots wrap around that which is alive and whole. Soon, the whole garden drowns beneath the oil. Their heir returns to discover his home has been torn asunder. There is more to the story. There are the people driven from their home and trampled underfoot, their souls shut from their bodies, their bodies altered beyond any recognition. A queen rising from amongst the muck to rule her people. A glorious, unending oneness. A life without war or conflict. The heir looks on all this with horror. When Tamiya wrote the story, she feared all of this. She didn't understand the peace that came with being part of a greater family. This is not the way she'd tell the story now. But it is almost done, and she will continue telling it. Seiju, the tree that once held this plane together, bursts apart. Like wine spilling from a cask, oil runs from between the splinters, dripping onto the thirsty earth. An unholy screech pierces the ears of all those who will listen, Kami torn from their home, scatter out of the district. Some find their ends at the tip of a lance, some find them torn apart by completed fissures, joining with their catches. But the result is always the same. The Kami dissolve into a fine mist. Tendrils of smoke rise from the blackened soil, from the bridges dissolving into nothing until the whole district is swallowed by the fog of dead Kami. There's a distant part within her that is screaming at the sight of all of this, a small voice ringing in her ear, a tingling at her fingertips. But she cannot say she is afraid. This is what's right for Kamigawa. After centuries of war, have they not earned peace? Is this not simply another step to become whole? The scroll itself becomes oil in Tamiyo's hands, dripping between her fingers. This is how the story ends, and how it always has ended, with Phyrexia's victory. A scab turns into a scar when you pick at it too much. A wound scars when it does not receive proper care. Kamigawa's bleeding. Ravnica is too. But Ravnica's got plenty of walkers to keep it safe. That's Teo's whole thing. To start, and Ral's been dreaming up countermeasures for a while now. Seti had a hunch something big was coming. They can handle things for a while, at least. Kaya and Veraska were supposed to hold Ravnica down while Jace coordinated with the other planes. That wasn't going to happen now. They'd managed without them. Kaito asked her for help stanching the bleeding on Kamigawa. And after what they'd been through, helping is the least she can do. Even if she's got her own wounds to worry about. Kaya's not sure how long hers will hang around. Are these the sort of memories that change who you are in the afterlife? If so, she's hopelessly lost. Seeing new Phyrexia was bad enough, but being in the middle of an invasion, watching new Phyrexia tear a plane limb from limb, the only way to keep from hurting is to let herself go numb to the sights. There's too much going on to save everyone. The ground rattles with the cratering footfalls of centurions. Snarling machine hounds roam the streets, with some people caught inside their lattice of bone. Centuries of history evaporate in an instant. Hundreds of potential futures are snuffed out all at once. There's no time for thinking about it. No time for bitterness over how this all happened or why she's the one who must pull the gatewatch together. No time for wondering what might go wrong. People are falling. No time to reconcile with the way her stomach twists after a planeswalk either. There's only moving, only doing. She must act. Kaya runs. One leap takes her onto a balcony as it splits off. Another sees her landing on a teetering floor beyond. Horror sets in a second later. The house plants. Scattered clothing. The ruined kitchen gives breath to her worst fears. This was a residential building. Hopefully most of its inhabitants escaped. A half-finished bowl of noodles at least says the people in this unit did. But there are others, aren't there? A scream catches her ear. 
muffled by the ongoing chaos. Kaya phases through the wall with its knickknacks and memories, trying not to think about how all those will be lost after today. A young boy and his dog quiver in the corner on the other side. Fallen supports have trapped the two of them in place. There's space enough for the dog to squeeze through, but the boy would have far more trouble. Kaya can't leave them here. She doesn't have much of an exit plan, doesn't know exactly how they're all going to make it out, but she can figure it out along the way. After all, it can't be harder than figuring out what to do about this invasion. Phasing through the fallen supports is easy enough. Normally, phasing the boy out of his position would be hard, but it's easier when he wants out just as much as she wants to help him. She offers him a hand. He takes it. She pulls him through the fallen beam. The boy grins, and the dog squeezes through after them. How are we getting down? he asks. A fair question, given the sight in front of him, this whole side of the building's been torn off. Tawashi looms, or what remains of it. Floors and furniture tumble to the ground as smoke rises from the earth, an acrid, oily smoke Kaya doesn't want to think about too closely. The streets are packed with those fighting against the invasion and those furthering it. Black oil seeps from the mouths and eyes of the attackers and foul Phyrexian symbols glow on every surface. Worse, every few minutes a thundering boom shakes the plane once more, heralding the attack of Norn's skeletal, glowing branches. If Kaya was a kid watching all this, she'd ask the same question. But she's an adult now. Her job is to find answers where there are none. We're going to jump from one place to the next, she says. The boy tucks his dog inside of his shirt. Are you good at jumping? The best, says the boy. She hopes he is. She takes his hand, the two of them approaching the lip of the remaining floor. Up ahead, there's a swinging remains of a balcony. If they can get onto that, then maybe they can shimmy down a rain pipe to safety. On three, she says. He nods. One, two, three. The two of them jump at the same time, Kaya keeping the boy's hand in her own. But just as they should be landing, the balcony falls away. Kaya, the boy, and the dog plummet. You have a lot of thoughts when you think you're going to die. Fewer when you're responsible for saving someone else. Kaya thinks fast. She might be able to save the boy if she can slow down their flight. That's going to be the priority. As he starts to scream, she clutches him to her chest. She closes her eyes. Impact never comes. An unseen force pushes up against them, slowing their fall. Seconds before they hit the ground, they instead hover above it. Whatever's gripping them can't hold much longer. The two of them are trembling in its hold. A Phyrexian? Try to be less reckless next time. Kaito. Kaya opens her eyes to see him. His telekinesis is barely holding them up. Sweat beads on his forehead. Handling a human-sized object, let alone three, must be pushing his powers to their limit. Blood, oil, and dirt are spattered across his slick armor. He gives her a nod. The boy acts first, hopping onto the ground. A woman nearby shouts for him and he runs without a second look back. A woof from his shirt tells her the dog's okay too. Kaya gets up. She flicks the tip of her nose with her thumb. Thanks, she says. Would have been lost without you. He lets that stand without correction, which she supposes is fair. We have to move fast. The Beseju district is their prime target. The whole thing, the tree... Kaito trails off, but Kaya can find her own answers. The tree over Tawashi is rent asunder. A foul waterfall pours from its body. That's... That's awful, Kaya says. It is, Kaito nods. And worse, Tamio did it. Opened a scroll. You can see her, Kaya points towards Tamio floating high above the city near Beseju's weeping bows. She's still reading from them. If no one takes her out, this is only going to get worse. Hells, they're talking about taking out friends now. Not that Kai is any stranger to assassination, but there's something different about this. Tamio of all people? We've both got the skills for this. Should I do it, or do you want to handle her? It's personal, Kaito says with a nod. The Kami are going to want to fight this as much as we do, 
the ones who can fight. See if you can convince them to come. Speaking of help, where's the Wanderer? Kaya didn't mean it as a jab, but Kaito seems to take it as one. The corner of his lip twitches. She's coming, Kaito says. You mean she isn't here? She'll be here, he says. Just have a little faith. All around them, Kamigawa is crumbling. He says, have faith. Is that a bad joke? Or is it a scab they keep picking at? Tamio floats above them, or something that was once Tamio. She doesn't look down on them, doesn't seem to move, doesn't seem to care about what she's doing. Nothing could be further from the woman Kaito met in Atawara. He sizes up the oil slick bark of the tree, no matter what he thought of her before. This is about more than just him. Kaito sets his foot against the bark. He gets about three steps up before someone calls to him. Are, are you going up to fight her? The voice is small and timid. As much as he'd like to ignore it, he knows he can't. Besides, if there's a kid hanging around this place, they need to scatter and fast. I am. You should get going. I can't, says the voice. When he looks down, he catches sight of a kid, a little Nizumi in motley metal armor and a homemade helmet that obscures his face. He must have cobbled it together out of scraps. Wait a second, that's my mom up there. Nashi, he asks. Sure enough, he nods. Kaito lets himself down from the tree. You don't want to be up there, he says. Things are going to get bad. But you're not going to hurt her, are you? Nashi asks, fussing with his hands. She looks different, but that's still her. I think she's forgotten herself. I thought, maybe if I talked to her? Kaito runs a hand through his hair. I don't think it's that simple. You have to let me try, now she says. He draws himself up to full height, which isn't very tall. I came all the way out here to help when I heard things were getting bad. Mom said that's what heroes do. If you can bring me up somewhere she can see me, then I'm sure she'll listen. No matter who she is, she'll always love me, she promised. Kaito's chest goes tight. He doesn't want to do this, but... But if it was Aiko up there? Kaito doesn't want to think about that possibility. Yet, he knows he'd do anything he could to get her back. Even if getting her back didn't seem like an option. Tamio ended up this way because of him. At least he can do is try this plan. All right, Kaito says. How's your climbing? Okay, Nashi says. Not good enough when there's all this stuff on the tree it didn't seem like i should touch it you shouldn't kaito says he takes a repulsor from his belt nashi couldn't weigh much right kaito clips it to nashi's sash and turns it on a soft hum radiates as he starts to float walk in the direction you want to go it's a little slow but you'll be able to follow along if you hit the button one more time it'll shield you don't hit it after that unless you want to drop nashi nods Kaito swallows, shaking away the sense of dread. If worse came to worse, he'd tell Nashi to leave. But maybe he's right. Maybe there's a way to break through all of this. Stranger things have happened. They need to try. Beseju doesn't make itself easy to climb. Between the torrents of oil raining down above them and the chaos behind them, there isn't much in way of mercy. Normally there were branches lower to the ground upon which some of the kami dwelled. But all of those have split apart. The first branch that suits them is far higher up, and only half stable at that. The air is cold and thin when they at last alight upon it. If it weren't for his training, Kaito would be dizzy. Nashi isn't so lucky. When his paws meet the bark, he sways from one to the other, clutching at his stomach. Kaito sets a hand on his shoulder. He points ahead to where Tamio still hovers. Take a second if you need it, but she's there. Hasn't noticed us either. Nashi takes two steadying breaths. Kaito breathes along with him. Sometimes it helped to have company when it came to that sort of thing. Okay, I'm ready, says Nashi. Kaito hopes he is. 
Just in case things go wrong, he unsheathed his sword. I've got your back. Step by unsteady step, Nashi makes his way to the end of the branch. Kaito follows a pace or two behind, his heart hammers in his ears. Something in Tamio had to remain. Something in her would remember, right? Mom? Tamio's head swivels all the way around her neck. The eyes that behold them are not the kind, inquisitive eyes that Kaito once knew. There's something else entirely, rimmed with black, the tears on her cheeks a testament to what she has become. Tamio says nothing. Around her, the scroll swirls. The light catches the sharp edges of her claws. It's me, Nashi. You remember me, right? He asks. I... I don't think you want to do any of this. I think you've made a mistake. But I know someone's making you. I just want you to to remember... Like in the stories about lost princes, Nashi trembles so hard that it's difficult for him to speak. Nashi, says Tamio, what are you doing here? Kaito reaches out to steady the small Nezumi. And it is then that the rest of Tamio's body snaps around to match her head. Then that her face retches into a scowl. A shard of metal shoots towards them, flung from the orbits of the scroll floating around Tamio. It is only Kaito's time-honed instincts that save him. He deflects the shards with telekinesis the way he deflected all of the stones his instructors flung at him. The clang of metal rings in his ears. I want nothing more than for you to join me, Nashi, says Tamio. Her voice rings wrong to Kaito, like a twisted cicada's cry. You're only afraid because you don't understand. There is nothing to fear. In the light of new Phyrexia, all are one. Kaito steps in front of Nashi. Go back towards the tree. I can't leave her. This isn't your mother. Kaito snaps. Now go. Kaito gives Nashi a push further back. If things are going to get violent, there's no way he wants Nashi to see it. No sooner than Kaito shoves Nashi away, does Tamio descend on him. Tamio was someone who did what she could to support others, a storyteller, an investigator, a woman devoted to her family. But now... Phyrexia changed her, warped that curious storyteller into a cruel hero band. There's nothing behind those oil-weeping eyes. Tamio's claws slice through the air, followed by weaponized scrolls that grab at Kaito's neck and arms, threatening to bind and overwhelm him. Kaito slices through the paper while keeping the metal at bay, but his footing on the slick branch is treacherous. He slips. Tamio's claws skitter and spark off Kaito's armor before he manages to recover. The slightest skid of his feet and those claws will find a home across his neck. He manages to recover his balance with only a tear across his armor to show for it. Kaito holds his sword out before him. Tamio stares back at him unblinking. This is a pointless fight. Maybe for you, Kaito says. There's no way you're going to win this. Without even a gesture, Tamio sends five more shards flying towards him. Kaito blocks four, the fifth slices him across the cheek. I pity you, Tamio says, fighting against peace to maintain your loneliness. You stand in the way of your own enlightenment. Like a child, you fight against the parents who only wish to welcome you. Hearing her like this tears him up. Kaito hopes Nashi can't hear her. And he hopes, too, that Nashi isn't watching when he throws his weight into a lunge. Tamio sways back and counters. A scroll wraps around his leg and he tries to shift his weight and cut himself loose. Tamio pulls. Kaito flips feet overhead before he knows what's happened, dangling far above Tawashi. The smoke of the burning city stings his eyes. Somehow, he keeps hold of his sword. I'm giving you one final opportunity to surrender, Kaito. Phyrexia can give you the life you've always wanted. Come home and let me welcome my family. Blood rushes to his head. Think. If he cuts himself down, he's going to fall. Maybe he'll be able to catch himself on something, maybe not. But he doesn't have many better options. 
I like my life the way it is, he says. Kaito makes the cut. He falls. Impact never comes. Instead, he feels something cool and soft beneath him, something familiar. We're up to three, if you're keeping count. That voice. A smirk comes to him before his eyes are open. It's the Emperor. She lands atop the branch in a hush of cloth, her sword held out at her side, which means he must have landed on Kyodai, the guardian spirit of Kamigawa, whose soul is bound to the Emperor. Call it even with me? Kai's voice tells Kaito he isn't alone. She's right next to him, the two of them riding together. For now, Kaito says, I told you she'd be here. Kyodai swoops back up towards Tamio, their level with the branch now. His eyes are trained on the Emperor as she confronts Tamio. Each step is cautious and graceful. The slickness that troubled Kaito isn't a concern for the Emperor. What jocularity there was in her initial greeting is gone when she addresses the monstrosity before her. Is this truly the place for a fight, Tamio? The Emperor asks. You should be asking yourself that, Tamio responds. A flurry of shards fly out towards her, each split in two by a single cut of the Emperor's blade. Tamio backs away with each step the Emperor takes towards her stopping right beside a frightened Nashi. Tamio's hand settles on Nashi's head. Kaito's stomach twists. He wonders if he should look away. Instead, he finds the strength to call out, Nashi, turn around. Tamio reaches for a scroll at her waist, one bound with an iron band. She slips the band free with a finger. The silken paper unfurls. Kyodai, the emperor shouts. The great kami beneath them flies to her side. The emperor holds her sword towards her companion, and Kyodai breathes upon it. Shining white lines the blade. Characters float in the air around her. Kyodai's power flows through the emperor. Tamio's mouth begins to move. Nashi, at last comprehending what is about to happen, turns away. A flash of white light, the sound of a blade unsheathing, the whistle of a distant gale. Tamio falls. Kaito is on his feet in an instant. Nashi is all alone up there now. He's going to need company. By the time Kaito has closed the distance, the wanderer is there to meet them. Kaito hugs Nashi tight. That wasn't her, Nashi repeats. That wasn't... Why was she like... Why didn't she? There aren't any easy answers. Certainly none Kaito can summon. A stone in his throat keeps him from speaking. The Emperor bows her head with grief. Your mother will live on in your memory. And the stories you tell of her. It is wise counsel, but not necessarily comforting to someone in the thick of pain. Nashi's sobs only get louder and Kaito can't blame him. Another hand alights on his shoulder oddly light and cold. Kaya never seemed the type for tearful reunions, but maybe after what they saw on New Phyrexia, she's singing a different tune. Any comfort is welcome now. Even Kyodai wraps himself around them all. For a moment, it feels as if they're trying to hold the plane together. Perhaps in the case of this one young boy, they are. Peace lasts until they hear Nashi's mother calling for him. Tamio's voice does not drift up from the pile of metal the Emperor struck down, but from right among them. This wasn't the cold Phyrexian whisper, of, but the warm, familiar tones of her old self. Nashi, I'm sorry. Kaito shields Nashi with his body. Before them is a strange being, densely packed floating characters form a woman's silhouette. They glow and dim as if breathing. When they hear Tamiel's voice, a light at the center glows even brighter. Characters wink in and out of existence and change as he studies them. Tawashi's projected neons can achieve all sorts of trickery, but this is something different. The way it's moving feels too intentional to be random, too imperfect to be artificial. The light glowing within reminds him more of a kami than any of Tawashi's technical wonders. I understand you might be wary of me, 
but I mean you no harm, Tamio says. What are you? Kaito asks. Not a ghost, that's for sure, Kaya calls. She's at the edge of the branch. What do you want? The silhouette turns towards each of them and then nods. I am what remains of Tamio, her story unending. You may think of me as her memory. Many years ago, she created me in anticipation of her death and sealed me away within the scroll until I was needed, bound with an iron ring. Tamio's memory, her story, pauses. I had hoped I might never be. How do we know you aren't, Kaito starts, but now she is already breaking away from him towards the odd conglomeration of characters. When he meets them, they swarm, settling into his arms. Kaito moves towards the boy, but the emperor gestures for him to stop. The emperor turns away, towards the body, toward Kamigawa, toward the ruins of the night. She's telling the truth. How do you know, Kaito asks. How do you know this isn't another Phyrexian scheme? Were you watching closely? Before I struck Tamio, mouthed something. I saw that, but she could have been doing anything. I thought she was preparing a curse. She wasn't, the Wanderer says. All of the shards she threw at me went too wide to do any damage. Didn't you notice? She sets a hand on one of Kyodai's many masks, and the Kami touches hers in turn. A hard-won moment of tenderness on a battlefield like this. Tamiya was making a request in the only way she could. Kaito looks back over his shoulder. Now she is surrounded by the characters, by the story unending. It isn't a clean victory, or even a good one. Kaito looks over the burning city below Boseju's wounded canopy. So many are dead, so many are dying, so many more that will die. In the distance, he sees shapes moving through the strange smoke, giant mechs lumbering towards the impact barb, imperial forces gathering to counter the Phyrexian assault. How much can they do? How many can they save? Tamio fell, but now she lived. Considering the work left to do, he'll take it. There's a story. Once upon a time, there was this great evil, one that threatened to swallow the planes of the multiverse whole. Unfeeling and uncaring, it infected the hearts of those who it encountered. There was someone who fought against it. There was a protector in white. March of the Machine, Episode 3, Mother, Son, and Story. Written by K. Arsenault Rivera. Narrated by Wyatt Fawcett. Thank you again so much for, for watching these and for sharing them on social media. Um, I can't share my appreciation enough Uh for just having a platform or being able to, to do this sort of thing. I really enjoy doing it. Um, and these stories are amazing and thrilling. Um, so yeah, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, please do. We're trying to raise that subscription number to get access to some more tools here on YouTube. Otherwise sharing, um, the videos would really help. Uh, I'm going to try to wrap up all, of the main story episodes by the end of next week because that's when previews start so i hope that we chat soon and thank you so much for spending some time here with me on kamigawa i'll see you on the next plane